introduce both cadet leadership development training. What that looks like is you're learning to lead at the platoon level. So who knows how big a platoon is? And it's about, it's about 40 people. And I will say it's, it's a little bit of a shock whenever you have 40 people looking to you for the first time and you're trying to take them through a mission, take them through getting back home safe. It's, it's really a great, it's a great rapid leadership. Then you can do cadet troop leader training. What that looks like is you go out into the regular army for three weeks and you basically do a, a short internship for a second lieutenant. This summer I found myself out at Fort Carson, Colorado, which is sandwiched directly in between Colorado Springs and Denver. So what I got to do was go out and have fun with real soldiers and learn how I was going to do my job. More of the admin side of it, but I got to learn how I was going to do my job. I got to do so in one of the most beautiful and most awesome places on earth. I was in Denver, I got to watch the Rockies and the Nuggets. You don't really get that kind of sports in North Carolina. Also, like, you're able to just get out and explore, which is so much fun. I've been able to see the world as, as a result of being at West Point. That, and you also do a leadership detail, they call it a training detail up here, but that's another rapid leadership. What that consists of is you're taking other cadets through one of these parts of the, uh, through the training model. So I was a company commander last summer, and so what I did was I took about 130 kids and I was responsible for getting them through that basic training. It's, it's probably going to be your most intensive rapid leadership. You're actually, you're hands on all the time. You're not just making sure they're good, you're making sure what they're about to do is good. You're making sure that what they just did was good. Because not only are you trying to make sure they're having a good experience, you're trying to make sure that the program itself gets better and whoever's actually running it next year can use your comments, use what you've found to make it better as well. Then you can either do an IED which is either for Division One athletes, that's in the summer you're doing your fall camp, doing whatever you, or your summer camp, doing whatever you need to do to get ready for your season. Or you can do academic opportunities. These are where they send cadets out in the world to actually do real internships. I've had buddies who work, who've gone to Goldman Sachs, the UN, they've gone to Germany just to do like a cultural exchange. And the opportunities really are endless and they're pretty great. And then finally, you can do a military qualification school. So those are what those two pictures on the left are from. That's air assault school. It's pretty difficult to get in the real army. They'll send people to jump out of planes a lot. But not really. They won't teach you how people get familiar with helicopters too frequently. And so what you need to do in that school, kind of the culminating event, it's about a 50-yard repel out of a helicopter. We were still on the way up. That's actually me on the right. If you can see the two people in the helicopter. Right? It's, it's a good time. And it's also something that your soldiers are going to respect when you get out of the real army. They're going to say, oh, this guy has done this, or he's done that. It's, it's kind of a, it's a skill identifier that they'll be able to know you have, which is pretty cool. And so your experience as a second lieutenant isn't going to be uniform with everyone else. There are 17 different main branch opportunities you can go into, whether that's more of the HR side, or whether you actually want to be running around, sleeping in the woods, doing the actual Army stuff. The job's are really endless. I find out my branch, not this Thursday, but the one after, and I'm hoping to be an armor officer. And Colonel Heath, would you like to talk about your branch? I was infantry. I uh, decided to go be a ground pounder, and I went airborne ranger, and uh, all that good stuff for, for a while. But just to play off on a little bit and go beyond what you're doing here, after, you've got a five year commitment after you graduate. But some people, like a um, guy I live with in my community, he, he, he stayed for 30 years. The Army was his uh, life, and he enjoyed it and retired. I stayed six years in the active Army mm -hmm. and got out and ended up working for Department of Defense uh, contractors, Lockheed, Texas Instruments. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I stayed in the Army Reserve for 22 years. I didn't plan on that, it just happened. But I stayed in the active Army Reserve for 22 years and had and switched around from branch to branch depending on where I lived. Got to travel to Europe, Turkey, uh, numerous other places in the world. So you can take your career however you want it, but West Point, as Campbell is telling you, gives you a great foundation to go wherever you want to go. Can you comment uh, on aviation for officers? I know the majority of them, aviation in the Army, flying 
hands on will be by enlisted, I believe. Well, or warrants. warrants. Yes, sir, warrant officers. So officers in the Army, up until about their major times, so about the eight or probably about the 10 to 12 year time frame, they actually do fly. So let's say if you're flying actual Black Hawk helicopters, or if that's, your, if that's the aircraft you're assigned to, as a second lieutenant, you'll actually lead a platoon of Black Hawks from the front when you're flying. Yeah. And so it is funny why mainly a lot of the warrant officers that you see in aviation are former commissioned officers who decided they wanted to keep flying and didn't want to get removed from that. They took a warrant rank. Right? Yep, so they took a yeah. warrant rank right to stay on, actually stay behind the uh, stay behind the controls. That's not right. It is. It is. And I think it's still true. There's more ships and there's more flying opportunities in the Army than there is in the Air Force today. Huh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've, got a, we've got a really bad habit of being in first. Sorry about that. That low and slow, though, gets you killed. So. Yeah, it will. <coughs> I'd throw that in. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> So we're going to actually start talking about the application process now. So if you're thinking about applying, this, this is where you might want to start paying attention. Your actual application is due the 31st of January of your senior year. That's going to be what's actually getting turned into the school. That's your essays, your test scores, your letters of recommendation from teachers. That's, <coughs> that's when all that is due. But even before that, or mostly, it depends on the nomination source, you have to get a nomination. What this looks like is you're getting a, basically you're getting a stamp of approval from either a senator, so for anybody going through the process now, it's going to be Senator-elect Bud next year, or Senator Tom Phillips, or you can get one through your congressman, which, is it David Browser? Right. Or still? <coughs> yeah. And so that would be David Browser for y'all. So they, they usually have contacts at their office you can find if you want to actually go through that. But, one of the areas where we see a surprising amount of people get weeded out in the applications process is in the actual Department of Defense Medical Evaluation Review Board. This is where they want to make sure that you're actually physically qualified and you're a, <clears throat> you're a smart investment to put an education into it. Because if you have some kind of pre-existing medical or health condition, it's, it might be weeded out in the application process. And there are some eligibility requirements. Um, Looks like, I'm not seeing any rings on any fingers, so I don't think anybody's married. It doesn't look like anybody's pregnant either, so I think we're good. <laughs> oh, Did you get married, can you get divorced and then go? I'm kidding. Can we go back one? Oh, yes, sir. Um, there's a presidential nomination that the parent was that you're active duty, I guess, or if there's a parent that's a retiree. Right. There's a vice president you can apply for. There's another one, I'm gonna put a plug in, JROTC nomination, there's not many. But if you're an honor unit, like we are, then West Point will accept a nomination from us. If we're not an honor unit, they won't. Air Force will in some cases. Sometimes they won't either. That's another reason why I hammer home we want to be an honor unit, because it opens opportunities for us. And it, it is another opportunity for any Laney student to become a cadet in our unit and if they excel to qualify for a JRTC nomination. So it's another source, really. Of nomination. So this is what the actual application is going to look like. Excuse me. So about 60% of your application is going to be how you performed academically in high school. So that's going to be what your GPA was. They do accept weighted GPAs, so whatever honors, whatever AP, I don't know if they do IPs here. They did in South, but whatever you did, that's where all that's going to come into play. That's your, that's your test scores as well, your SAT, ACT. So that's where all that gets turned out. About 30% of your application is going to be your leadership experience. So that could be a school office you held or a class office, something you did in a club, something you did in a sport, whether you were your JROTC, battalion commander, company commander, you know. That's where they want to see what leadership potential you have based off of what your capabilities and what you've been able to do in the past are. And then the final 10% is the candidate fitness assessment. Which, Sam, do you want to tell everybody in here about that? Um, yeah, the candidate fitness assessment, um, it's not that difficult. It's a one mile run after you complete some physical things like one minute of push ups, one minute of sit ups, uh, as many pull ups as you can do. Uh, basketball. Basketball, basketball, basketball throw. throw, that's the hardest one for me. <laughs> Way less than the average. And then shuttle run, yeah, is the last one. And then you go and run a one mile run. 
Yeah, everyone thinks they're an athlete until it's time to get on your knees and throw a basketball. <laughs> <laughs> that's, 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 I need to see what this looks like. <laughs> it's, 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 really it's a humbling experience, I'll say that much. One thing about the SAT, ACT, as you can see, 60% of your, you get a cumulative whole score. You get ranked by your file that you create if you want to go to West Point and you get so many points for this and that and the other. SAT and ACT, as you can see, are pretty important. And West Point super scores. That's the all they have is super score. And so what that means is you take it as many times as you can stand it because if you make 650 on the verbal and 750 on the math, and the next time it's reversed, they take the two best components of that test and put them together to make your best score. So you want to take it as many times as you can to get your highest score. A lot of people don't, don't understand that. Oh, one thing, I don't know if you're going to bring it up, um, if you're there yet or not. There are a number of ways to get nominations. You have to have one nomination. Uh, the best way, the most common way, as uh, Campbell said, is through your congressional uh, folks, uh, your senators or your representatives. But there are a number of other ways, like you said, JROTC. And another way, if down the road, I think you were talking about enlisting in the Army, if you're talking about going a different route, ROTC, or enlisting in the service, you can, come, as long as you meet the age eligibility, you can come in if you decide, hey, now I want to I be an officer and I want to go to West Point. You can come in through the enlisted ranks. And it's, they go, there's, uh, I, forget, I forgot how many, I think there's several hundred um, appointments that are given through the enlisted ranks. And they go unused every year because, and, for whatever reason, enlisted folks, the company commanders that are out there don't uh, publicize it or not to work. So just keep that in mind. Just something important to uh, just to kind of take a mental picture of or whatever, is if you don't know how to contact your senator or representative, just go to house.gov or senate.gov. It's that easy type in your actual physical town or zip code or whatever, and they'll, it'll take you to who, whoever your representative is, give you a general phone number you can call, and whoever's at the front desk at that office will be more than happy to patch you through whoever they think can help you best. So they, well, they take care of you pretty On this well. slide, you can see this asterisk about must be an honor unit. Again, my people that are here, I don't do it for ego. I do it because it, it's good for Laney, it's good for Wilmington, it's good for school board. It's good for the district. It's good for you. And you always want to be the best you can be in anything you do. So that's why I want to do that. Another one, I, oh, that's not service connected, but I think another may be Medal of Honor recipient. I think they get an automatic nomination. No, obviously not a point. Does that check with you? I've read that somewhere. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm not sure. sure the, Medal of Honor they're, recipient. They're children. Children of Medal of Honor recipient. Children of Medal of Honor. Yeah. Which is pretty great. The children of Medal of Honor winners. They qualify, they're in. <clears throat> yeah. they're in. That applies to about wow. yeah. about seven people in the United States, right? right. <laughs> so there are some things you can do if to either prepare yourself to get better or if maybe you don't get in on the first try. The first thing that a lot of people do is the summer leadership experience. You kind of get like a first general exposure to West Point. It's a week up there and go through academic workshops. I remember when I did it, I did civil engineering, electrical engineering, and military history, which learning from military history as a history nerd from the actual curator of the West Point Museum was, was a pretty cool experience. That, you get to spend two days out in, the, out in the woods doing Army stuff, which was pretty fun for me as a high school. So it's one of those things where even if you're not sure if you'd like to go or not, it's something that looks great on an application for another college or it is something that might convince you want to go yourself. If you're not quite 
if you could use a little bit of maturing, whether that's academically or uh, basically any reason the academy might deem you as a really good fit, but maybe not quite ready, one opportunity that they offer is the United States Military Academy Preparatory School. And it's, it's a mile up the hill, so it's, it's just right there beside campus. But what you can do there is take a year to develop in whatever they think you might need to develop in. I know my roommate actually went to prep school, and he, his was math. And so he took an actual academic curriculum, but he had face-to-face -face interactions with a math tutor two days out of the week, basically curating, kind of just developing whatever skills they felt he needed to work on, which for him it was calculus and math. But now he's an operations researcher, data science major, so he's not struggling with that. And then also kind of offering similar opportunities are the civil preparatory schools. They're listed right there. Uh, could you talk about the AOG scholarships that they do for those? Sure. Um, the, we got a um, Hogger graduate last year at Georgia Military College right now, doing really well. 